Well, I'd like to welcome you all to the California Earthquake Clearinghouse Virtual Workshop Webinar. Um, this is the first of two. We're going to be doing this, the similar one uh, on May 18th at 12 to 2. So if you have additional friends or uh, coworkers who'd like to catch this, uh, we will be uh, doing it live again uh, with question and answers. Uh, the, the California Earthquake Clearinghouse is composed of five managing members, and they're listed at the bottom here. We have ERI, USGS, California Geological Survey, Cal OES, and the Seismic Safety Commission. This webinar is supported with a National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program grant funding uh, and is also hosted by the Earthquake Engineering and Research Institute, ERI. So the purpose and the goal of the workshop is to improve and increase understanding of the California Earthquake Clearinghouse, how it works, when it's activated, uh, explain who participates and how to be involved. Uh, we're also going to explain event data collection, processing, and access. Uh, and also including in this is a, is a presentation on the safety assessment program, also known as SAP, and the disaster service worker program as it applies to the, the uh, earthquake clearinghouse. The webinar logistics uh, include about an hour and a half of speakers. We have six speakers talking for about approximately 15 minutes each. Uh, please place your questions in chat as, as they come up. And at the end of the program, uh, we have a half hour dedicated to answering all those questions. And once again, I just want to keep blasting the California Earthquake Clearinghouse.org website. Uh, on that site, uh, these uh, video recordings will, will be posted uh, once the, the second clearinghouse is, uh, webinar is done. And uh, we'd also like you to check out the joining the mailing list. That is how you uh, find out about activations when an earthquake occurs and, and the clearinghouse is activated. The speakers today are myself. I'll be kicking it off with an introduction to the clearinghouse. I'm Cindy Pridmore uh, at CGS. I'm a senior engineering geologist within the seismic hazards mapping program. And I'm the uh, chair of the, of the clearinghouse. Heidi Tremaine is gonna be the second speaker talking about clearinghouse operations and support. Heidi's with ERI and she's the co-chair of the California Earthquake Clearinghouse. Kate Thomas, uh, also from CGS, is gonna be talking about field data collection. Sherry Blankenheim from Cal OES is gonna be talking about clearinghouse coordination with Cal OES, the state operations center regions and local government. Don Gluckert will be uh, covering the disaster service worker program and Gerber Singh will be talking about this the safety assessment program. So what is the California Earthquake Clearinghouse? Uh, it's a physical location where scientists and engineers and other professionals come to become part of a larger temporary organization whose primary purpose is to collect and disseminate perishable, perishable field data. The Clearinghouse provides the opportunity for all agencies and researchers uh, in the field to coordinate reconnaissance efforts, manage access to restricted areas, and share findings. Who comes to the clearinghouse? Basically scientists, engineers, economists, sociologists, and others who conduct post earthquake related field investigations in the affected area. The California Earthquake Clearinghouse Managing Partners, as I've mentioned before, consist of ERI, California Geological Survey, Governor's Office of Emergency Services, Cal OES, uh, the Seismic Safety Commission and the US Geological Survey. And we have many, many other partners uh, that we rely on uh, for their collaboration and involvement listed below, but even more than that. So a little bit about the historical background of the California Earthquake Clearinghouse. The first informal California Earthquake Clearinghouse was convened by the state geologist, Wesley Brewer, the day after the magnitude 6.6 .6 San Fernando earthquake in 1971. There were more than 40 geologists, seismologists, and engineers convening at the California Geological Survey Office, then known as the CDMG. These included representatives from Caltech, USGS, ERI, Los Angeles, um, LA County and city, UC Santa Barbara. We had a variety of, of universities present uh, and other state and private consultants who met there to exchange information. Uh, Governor Ronald Reagan recognized um, the value of the, the earthquake clearinghouse, which then led the following year in 1972 to legislative action to ensure that lessons learned from future earthquakes would be learned. Just a brief uh, statement here on authority. So after a major and or damaging earthquake in California, the California Geological Survey is, is authorized to establish an earthquake clearinghouse and works in partnership with the managing members, ERI, USGS, Cal OES, and Seismic Safety Code, Se Seismic Safety Commission. Um, 
within the California Public Resources Code, uh, we have information, and this, this was established following the 1972 earthquake, that talks about CGS programs uh, related to earthquakes, uh, such as the, the survey shall carry out programs in cooperation with federal, state, and local government agencies that re reduce the loss of life and property and protect environment by mitigating geologic hazards. In terms of size hazard assessment, CGS con continues on a daily basis uh, to include identification and mapping of geologic hazards and estimates of their potential consequences to life, property, and the environment and the likelihood of occurrence. The last line there uh, within the state code uh, emphasizes the, the need for the clearinghouse, such as the emergency response to geologic hazards, including but not limited to those related to natural disasters, including the monitoring and assessment of anom anomalous geologic activity and the operation of a clearinghouse for post-event earthquake science investigations. Uh, the California Geological Survey has supporting agreements with all its managing partners. Some are formal, some are informal. <clears throat> we are to provide geotechnical data and advice to the Cal OES regarding natural hazards in support of emergency planning and information support as required during state disaster response operations. During a natural hazard emergency event, there is direct communication with the Cal OES via the 24-hour duty officer and the Cal OES hazard specialist. CGS coordinates investigations with the USGS under a memorandum of understanding. And uh, when an event clearinghouse is activated, CGS also coordinates its emergency response with ERI, California Seismic Safety Commission, and other state, local, and academic private entities. The clearinghouse is activated after an earthquake that meets any of the following parameters. When an urban area is struck by a damaging earthquake of magnitude six or higher, uh, upon recommendation of the managing partners, uh, even when the magnitude threshold is not exceeded, but damage is significant, and in a remote, less densely populated area, when an earthquake is large enough to, to damage structures and lifelines. Uh, a federal di disaster declaration is not necessary to activate the clearinghouse, but the clearinghouse will always be activated when there is a federal disaster declaration. Uh, the pictures over on the right <clears throat> are some of the first images that, that many of us saw on, coming out on social media after the, the 2019 Ridgecrest magnitude 6.4 on the 4th of July. Um, so we were trying to assess, this was in a rural area. Uh, it was the earthquake epicenter was about 11 miles outside of the town of Ridgecrest, which is a small community. Uh, and then there's the China Lake Naval Air Weapons Base to the north, which is all secured, secured land. So we, no one was actually posting any pictures of that because it's, it's, it's not a public, uh, uh, safe to, to present those pictures to the public. Uh, it's under, under security. So we're just starting to see cracks in the road, cracks in the ground, and we're beginning to wonder, you know, whether or not we should, we should, we should activate. Is this a large enough event? So there were conversations between CGS, ERI, uh, Cal OES, um, and USGS and Seismic Safety Commission to see if we would do it. By the end of the day, it was declared that uh, the clearinghouse would activate um, at, at the town of Ridgecrest. The California Earthquake Clearinghouse Operations Support. This is just sort of a brief outline, but um, we all do wear many hats uh, when we're there physically at the physical clearinghouse. Uh, ERI supports operations in a huge way, communication briefings and the virtual clearinghouse. CGS oper operation, supports operations of the, of the daily activities at the clearinghouse and also data collection and database management. USGS supports the data collection and the database management. Uh, Seismic Safety Commission um, was there to help with uh, clearinghouse operations. And Cal OES uh, supported us by securing a physical location and supports our communications with the California State Emergency Operations Center. Kate Thomas will talk about this in depth, but data collection apps are used to facilitate, facilitate systematic gathering and documenta gathering documentation and dissemination of data, uh, observations and findings on supports provided for accessing, uh, uh, uploading uh, the collection apps if you wish to, uh, to join in that activity. Uh, in 1994, the, the Northridge earthquake uh, if we look back in time, it was still using paper sheets. So people, if you come to the clearinghouse to collect data, you were actually given uh, 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 forms to fill out. So we've kind of, uh, you know, have come a long way and uh, definitely digital data is, 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 has been extremely helpful and quick to, to share. 
A uh, little bit about the clearinghouse. Every evening, uh, usually we have an evening briefing, and um, this is one of the most important, I think, aspects of the clearinghouse. It provides a forum for field teams to summarize and report out their findings uh, of the day. Uh, the briefings include call-ins from other remotely located field personnel, other invited agencies, and representatives uh, at the California Emergency State Operations Center in Sacramento. Uh, this is just a, a just a shot of it. You know, I'm, I'm sure many of you saw images that came from the Ridgecrest, but typical information that we, that the clearinghouse would be capturing in those first few days uh, would be uh, rupture. You can see in the upper left hand uh, uh, image uh, uh, an overflight view uh, that's starting to help the the, the, saw, the geologist on the ground uh, understand where the rupture was after the 6.4 and, the, and then the next day, the 7.1. Uh, the lower left-hand corner is an example of, of uh, lateral spreading that occurred in Trona. So this is information that's important to help uh, locals there understand, emergency uh, managers understand in terms of um, why it's occurring and, and how prolonged it might be. The, uh, Summary map on the right is an example of a provisional map of surface rupture. That one came out about a, six weeks after the initial earthquakes, but within the first five days, we had a similar map that also came out that showed that the epicenters relative to Ridgecrest. Ridgecrest is, I don't know if I, can, I, don't know if I have a pointer, but it is, uh, if you look at the little uh, index map, rupture classification box at the bottom, it's that little dark area to the, to the right of that is the, the community of Ridgecrest. The earthquakes were about 11 miles uh, outside of town, uh, both of them, and uh, created quite a bit of, of rupture uh, between the 6.4 and the 7.1. Another important part, and probably one of the most critical parts of the, of the California Earthquake Clearinghouse is the communication and coordination with emergency and management officials. Uh, the clearinghouse management has direct communication as I've mentioned before, with Cal OS 24 hour duty officers and with the state operations center. Um, initially, some of the first things that can happen is that the, the uh, state operations center can help us uh, locate and coordinate helicopter flyover support for initial reconnaissance. And, and this is key for large complex uh, fault rupture mapping, such as what happened in Ridgecrest to get, a, get an overview of what has happened. Those overflights are essential. Uh, evening briefings are shared with the state operations center and outward to regional and local emergency management. Um, the evening briefings also link the scientific and engineering communities with agencies and organizations responsible for emergency response. So in, information that's coming out in those briefings, um, uh, if not heard by, uh, by those emergency response personnel, that it will be summarized and, and provided to them. So we want to make sure that local recovery uh, can be informed uh, of that information as they're planning their response. The benefits of the California, physical California, physical clearinghouse are um, providing rapid assessment of the geologic hazard and documentation of perish perishable scientific information of use to scientific and engineering community for improvement of building codes in engineering and scientific advances. It supports the coordination of teams and individuals in the field. It supports the communication and coordination to expand access to restricted areas. Uh, it links the scientific engineering communities with agencies and organizations responsible for emergency response, as I've just mentioned before, and provides scientific expertise important for potentially directing response resources such as personnel, equipment, supplies to impacted areas that may have been missed by standard response measures. So that's the end of my presentation. My, my, my contact information is cynthia.pridmore at conservation.ca.gov. Uh, that's also on the Clearinghouse website. You can find that. And the Clearinghouse uh, website is californiaeqclearinghouse.org. And we can uh, make sure everybody gets, a, gets that sent out to them as well. And our next speaker is Heidi Tremaine. She is the ERI Clearinghouse Vice Chair, sometimes I refer to as co-chair. Um, uh, and she's gonna be talking about clearinghouse operations and support. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Cindy, for the introduction. I am Heidi Tremaine, I'm ERI's Executive Director. I am here to present to you a little bit about how ERI responds to earthquakes and the support we provide to the earthquake, California Earthquake Clearinghouse. Um, so I'm gonna briefly cover kind of who ERI is a little bit today, 
kind of the role that we play in support of the California Earthquake Clearinghouse, and then finally conclude with how you can get involved in clearinghouse activities now and after the next uh, California earthquake. EERI is the leading nonprofit membership organization that is dedicated to understanding earthquake risk and increasing earthquake resilience in communities worldwide. Uh, we have been around uh, since we, our establishment in 1948, um, and a key aspect of URI is that we bring together uh, members of uh, the technical community, all dedicated to advancing earthquake resilience, but for many different disciplines. We have a strong emphasis in engineering, as our name implies, with structural engineers, geotechnical engineers, uh, engineers uh, working in lifelines and many other areas, but as well as uh, the other disciplines you see listed here, geoscience, social science, planning, uh, emergency management, and more. Uh, EREI is a place where these diverse colleagues come together uh, to connect, learn, and lead uh, in our community and really make an impact. Uh, our flagship program is our Learning from Earthquakes program. This program has been around since ERI's founding in 1948, uh, sending teams to the field to investigate the inv impacts of earthquakes. Uh, the program was formalized in 1973. Um, and since that time has responded to more than 300 earthquakes in, in more than 50 countries around the world. The key aspects of a, a LFE response um, are that we send multidisciplinary teams, bringing experts from all these different disciplines together to study the impacts. And we combine both the academic world um, in research as well as practitioners in professional practice, um, merging them together to achieve the most learning and the most impacts. Some activities that are currently underway at LFE and some of our recent work, uh, we send reconnaissance teams. Uh, we've done some topic focused teams recently after the earthquake in Mexico and in Indonesia, studying topics that were kind of gaps being studied by other reconnaissance teams. We've also have some active committees so that are looking at how we can better study and understand community resilience to earthquakes from a lens of public health um, and business resilience as well. We also have a virtual earthquake response team called VERT that uh, studies earthquakes in the immediate aftermath. Anyone can join and contribute to the response, even if they're not in the local area or doing field studies. Uh, we also provide training opportunities through our travel study program to take the next generation uh, of leaders in earthquake engineering and earthquake science uh, into the field in areas that have been impacted by earthquakes uh, to help them learn and, and um, advance their skills and knowledge so they can continue to contribute and understand the impacts that earthquakes have in communities. We also do a lot of work in dissemination between webinars, meeting conferences, sharing the impacts, learning uh, sharing the learning from earthquakes over time um, through uh, reconnaissance reports, virtual clearinghouse websites. NERI is also growing in the area of looking at how we can actually advocate more strongly in communities impacted by earthquakes or communities that will be impacted by earthquakes um, uh, to do some advocacy work when earthquakes happen to advance policy that will better prepare communities. But today's focus kind of with all this bucket of work is really kind of a key role that we do for reconnaissance, which is clearinghouse coordination and response and support. The reason that ERI does this um, has been around for many, many years, but we have a key role through the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program, which is a federal program that links four key government agencies together, the US Geologic Survey, FEMA, National Science Foundation, and NIST. They all come together to advance uh, earthquake safety in the United States. And through their mandate, through the NEHR program, they also coordinate uh, post-earthquake response. And so um, one of the roles that ERI has explicitly mentioned in the current plan is to work with federal and state agencies to organize a field technical clearinghouse. So ERI had, does a lot of activities in that regard. Um, this plan is currently being updated and we anticipate that plan to continue to focus on clearinghouse response and supporting states like California uh, with um, initiatives to do so. Kind of as we think about clearing houses and response, it's probably good to take a pause and think about what is earthquake reconnaissance and what do we really mean by that? And when we're talking about the clearing house uh, being a place where we, um, we meet and, and collect and think about earthquake reconnaissance, I think it's important to note that when we think of reconnaissance, this is really scientific or engineering investigation um, and from other technical dis disciplines that's aimed at documenting important observations 
and identifying research topics and lessons for practice. As Cindy mentioned, we're trying to improve professional practice uh, so that earthquakes, we are better uh, prepared for earthquakes in the future and can advance mitigation in more thoughtful ways based on what we've learned. Um, and also make sure that research is, is uh, solving true problems that we're seeing out there in the field. And that is a key uh, responsibility of reconnaissance. Reconnaissance activities are not emergency response in and of themselves. Um, Post-earthquake building tagging does not come in under the reconnaissance flagship, it comes under response. And it's not support for detailed analysis or repairs or reconstruction of specific facilities or structures. It's really about trying to understand uh, what the impacts of this earthquake have been and how that can improve uh, our knowledge into the future. The function is of the clearinghouse, and Cindy alluded to most of these, but kind of uh, repeated here again, is that it's facilitating field investigations by scientists, engineers, uh, many other uh, technical experts who are out there in the field trying to glean knowledge about what has happened and what the impacts have been, um, and assist, and the clearinghouse assisting them coordinating with emergency management through access to sites, through sharing critical observations that would inform the response. Uh, and, and inform that practice. For example, um, in this South Napa earthquake that occurred in 2014, um, it was observed that the, the, some of the safety uh, barriers were placed around some buildings too close to the structure and that there was um, a falling hazard from aftershocks that could be occurred and message was sent through the clearinghouse back out um, through the operations center to inform them to move some of those uh, barriers back to a safer distance and and messages like that that are observed by the technical experts out in the field can be easily passed on uh, to those in the emergency response is a good example of that. Um, it also the clearinghouse also, also serves as a forum for sharing information. Uh, we use a virtual clearinghouse website, which I'll talk about momentarily. Meetings that Cindy mentioned are nightly briefings. It also provides ability to track field work and really avoid duplication of effort. Um, for recent earthquakes in California, even though that they've been smaller in magnitude, around magnitude six, um, from Ridgecrest earthquake se sequence or the South Napa earthquake, we still see hundreds of, of researchers and investigators uh, coming to the, to the field. And as earthquakes get larger, we want to make sure that that field work is coordinated, um, access is secured, and that there's not duplication of effort. So the clearinghouse is a place where everyone can learn who's doing what um, and make sure that the field work that being done is, is well coordinated. It's also a place where this information from all these technical experts out the field can be synthesized for response agencies, tell them what they need to know, um, what the latest insights are without getting into all the technical detail. Um, and it is important to know that the clearinghouse is a critical location for many investigators out in the field to meet and gather and, and coordinate, but it does not direct or control those activities. People voluntarily come, they're doing their own research investigation, they're doing their own response um, to investigations to gather knowledge, um, and, this, and the clearinghouse provides them a place to share and collaborate, but not direct what they're going to be doing. The key components of the clearinghouse um, are the physical clearinghouse location as well as a virtual clearinghouse. So the physical location is usually a place as um, mentioned that Cal OES helps to secure um, for the clearinghouse that provides a place where people can meet in the evening during the day, they can check in um, and, and meet with others in a physical location and join in physical briefings in the evening. We also have a virtual clearinghouse location as well that's established for California. Uh, which is a website where information can be shared um, publicly. So uh, it has a resource lighter, library, photo gallery, data map, and other resources that are provided by those in the field. ERI supports the California Earthquake Clearinghouse as vice chair of its management group. Um, we host the website, the California EQ Clearinghouse website, so I encourage you to visit that location. Um, and we also support CGS and other members of the managing group with any planning, training, exercises, activities that we do kind of uh, regularly to make sure that we're all prepared and able to respond to the next California earthquake effectively. Um, we support clearinghouse communications and of course link the clearinghouse also to the broader engineering community um, and then the technical community from which our members uh, form and then also to many other reconnaissance partners who are out there in the field. Uh, the establishment, kind of some of the work that we do really for when an earthquake happens, we do establish a virtual clearinghouse, deploy clearinghouse notifications, which I'll tell you about in a moment. 
um, and make sure that the engineering community is connected. Um, and we help host the nightly briefings so that the information can be shared effectively and efficiently. And um, we really support the work of CGS and USGS and some of the other groups uh, to share observations and data. So linking those engineering teams and fields and groups that are out in the field, um, making sure that their information is coordinated and shared with the uh, other groups, um, especially the, in the earth sciences with, this, with the strong data collection that you'll be hearing about in later presentation from Kate. Um, I wanted to kind of end here um, talking a tiny bit more about the Ridgecrest earthquake sequence and the response that took place. Um, there was a physical virtual clearinghouse um, that was established by ERI um, within 24 hours of the event. The physical clearinghouse uh, was then established with staff traveling along with CGS staff and others to establish the location that was remained open for one week with more than 60 people checking in um, and, and many teams responding as well. ERI hosted regular evening briefings um, every day during the immediate response and then um, less frequently um, over several weeks after the physical location was closed to ensure uh, good coordination between teams in the field. Kind of in total, over 120 people participated in these briefings to learn what was taking place um, at the clearinghouse and to coordinate their work. Um, we supported data coordination along with many other partners here uh, to share data um, and make sure that that was uh, collected and gathered and um, compiled with groups from USGS and CGS. And finally, in addition to this immediate clearinghouse response and activation, uh, there were also a series of activities that took place uh, to inform learning um, afterwards to the broader community. We hosted a webinar um, with a webinar briefing one month after the earthquake to share the preliminary findings from several different disciplinary views. Uh, we published a reconnaissance report uh, with multidisciplinary observations. And then eight months after the sequence began, um, we hosted with, with our partners uh, special sessions on this earthquake sequence as a part of the 2020 National Earthquake Conference to make sure that that knowledge is shared and the lessons and findings were shared more broadly. Um, the, the Clearinghouse website, Virtual Clearinghouse for Ridgecrest, that is linked here on the bottom, um, provides link to all the products from, from that response. I just wanna close here by with two slides here talking about how you can participate uh, with the clearinghouse. So when the next earthquake occurs, visit the website, californiaeqclearinghouse.org for information. We will post updates where to go look for the virtual clearinghouse links um, and for other needs that we have and how you can participate. If you're actually coming to the field, uh, please check in at Clearinghouse. We appreciate everyone who comes to the field checking at the Clearinghouse. Uh, the Clearinghouse is set up to provide site access where appropriate, um, and you're going to learn a little bit more about some ways in which we do that, but it provides a great way for you to know who else is in the field and how to co coordinate your work and, and get the access you need uh, for the, your specific research or uh, objectives. Uh, also, it's important to attend evening briefings, sharing what you found in the day with others and making sure that the work for the next day is planned. And finally, uh, important, I would be remiss not set on behalf of Kate saying, prepare and contribute your data, your photos, your observations. There are many tools out there that many uh, researchers are using. Uh, ERI has a fulcrum app that we use. Um, you're gonna hear more about many other tools by CGS and USGS and others. There's many others from some of the NSF uh, funded centers and others. Um, any tool is okay. We support uh, you collecting data. We just want you to try to share it back um, and we'll do the best with what we can and make sure it's shared with others. And finally, um, you, when the next earthquake occurs, learn in our dissemination events through the clearinghouse, they'll be announced to kind of webinars, conferences, events, uh, research workshops. We uh, appreciate your participation in, in that as we learn um, from the impacts of a future event. And, but right now today, the question is, what can you do? Subscribe to the mailing list. To, as Cindy mentioned this as well. This is the way that you can learn about what's taking place um, in the California Clearinghouse and as events happen. There's training opportunities that come up. CGS is hosting a, a GIS training coming up this May um, it, as kind of just a highlight of one thing coming up. Um, you're welcome to join ERI as a member and participate in our LFE committees and activities. From our Learning from Earthquakes program, we have our virtual response. We're always looking for people to participate in any earthquake around the world virtually. Uh, we also have our public health or business resilience committees looking for members. Uh, 
we have uh, other groups forming, thinking about school performance and, um, uh, and other topics that you can contribute to. Um, and finally, uh, we have earthquake webinars that are happening recently. Our next one is actually in just a couple of weeks here, a quick quick briefing that's uh, sharing some findings of a recent earthquake in Indonesia um, and hosted by our, our Northern California chapter of the URI. So there's a lot to learn. That event is also free, so visit our website to learn more. And this is my final slide here. I just wanna show exactly how you join that mailing list. Do it today. Uh, you go to CaliforniaEQClearinghouse.org backslash subscribe, or just hit the top right window, how to collaborate and join the mailing list. And you'll hear more about the clearinghouse and we hope to have you engage into the future. So with that, I'll pass it back to Cindy um, as we move on to the other presenters. Thank you, Heidi, that was awesome. Lots of great information there. I'm so glad these are gonna be, these videos are gonna be posted, these, these webinars are gonna be posted on the website, Clearinghouse website. So um, lots of great information that I think is really helpful and, and helpful to understanding the big picture. Our next speaker is Kate Thomas with the California Geological Survey and she's gonna talk about data collection. Good morning. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Kate Thomas and I am the GIS unit supervisor. Um, for California Geological Survey. I am going to talk to you this morning about schemas, data, and the field map application. This presentation was created with a collaboration from Luke Blair from USGS. CGS and USGS have been collaborating for years for the post-earthquake reconnaissance. And since Ridgecrest, we've been meeting regularly to try to create a schema that helps both of our organizations with, with the data that we need to acquire. We've also been working on how to make our field maps application um, more useful to the field team and easier to use, as well as creating um, facilitating communication using dashboards and also trying to make the data compilation um, during the event and after the event go more smoothly so we can get those data out quicker to the public. The schema team has consisted of Tim Dawson, Carla Rosa and myself from CGS, Luke Blair from USGS and Allie Pickering when she worked at USGS was also a very important uh, member of this schema group. For the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk to you about um, the importance of data and schemas, the ESRI field map application and ESRI dashboards as well as data compilation and sharing. As most of you know, it's very important that we collect these data quickly after an event before any weathering or erosion occurs. This rapid collection of perishable data allows us to define areas of interest um, for other data collection activities as well, such as LIDAR and optical imagery. It also increases our situational awareness of areas with ground deformation that could potentially affect infrastructure. After the event, we use these data to increase our basic understanding of earthquakes, but also for projects such as fault displacement prediction models. And CGS also uses these data to, um, to delineate Alquis Piolo earthquake fault zones. It's important that when different organiz when multiple organizations are responding, that we standardize our data and that we have a well-defined schema before the event happens. And this allows us to more quickly deploy our field teams. And so currently we can get field teams out in about 15 to 30 minutes with a working application. And Luke and I have been working very closely together to try to make that faster. Um, we also want on the back end for it to to really um, have this schema allow us to more quickly put this data in these data into a data compilation database and share them with, um, with other responding organizations as well as the general public. When creating a schema, it should take into account the lessons learned from field teams, data compilation teams, and end user needs. And so as far as the field teams, we need to be cognizant that a lot of our field staff are out there using um, cell phones or tablets. And so we wanna limit the amount of fields that they have to scroll through to find the fields to fill in um, and make that more user-friendly for them. We also on, want to ensure that we're collecting data that are important for the end users. So are we collecting the correct data for emergency managers as well as the compilers of these displacement data? And then we want to make sure that the schema is adaptable to the limitations of the software, not just ESRI, but also other 
other applications that some of you may be using outside of the ESRI environment. We have been working on schemas for points, lines, and polygons for deformation types of surface rupture, liquefaction, and slope movement. We also have a schema for facilities and utilities. So for any damage that our field teams happen to um, run across while they're in the field. And then we also have a schema for no deformation for points, lines, and polygons. And we realized in Ridgecrest that this was actually really important for us to have a no deformation layer to help facilitate the response through the clearinghouse. Because there were sections of the map that, we, that people would see that had no data associated with it. Um, but actually people had gone there. They had looked, they didn't see any deformation, but we didn't have any way of, of collecting that at the time for Ridgecrest. And so lessons learned from Ridgecrest, we're, we're reworking that schema to make it more useful for people who are responding. We also have an, avoid, an avoid, uh, event information point layer, and that's really for the GIS team to fill in with the epicenter information. Now, just recently, Luke Blair has created a script that allows us to pull data from the event page from USGS. It creates the epicenter point as well as pull, pulls in data from the shake map. So the shake map contour it adds it directly to our map in ArcGIS Online, which makes it available in field maps. So we're trying to automate a lot of these processes again to get our field teams out sooner and to be able to um, support our field teams better. This is just an example of our surface rupture point schema, which CGS and USGS have agreed upon. Um, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it does have drop downs or pick lists so that people can very easily just choose their option and then move on to the next field. For any integer fields, we give the units which are required um, for the data to be acquired in. And then we have some note fields as well. And we use up to a thousand characters in our note fields to ensure that the field teams have enough space to add any um, notes or details that they need to um, for, for, um, for a specific location that they're at. A very brief introduction to field maps uh, application. It is downloadable on any mobile device. Um, you simply sign in with your ArcGIS online account. You then get um, you get a list of maps that you're that you are available to you. You can cache the map or download the map to the device by clicking this ellipsis, and you can um, that allows people to use the device offline. So if you don't have cellular, you don't have Wi-Fi, you can still go out and collect data and sync those data back to ArcGIS online when you get back to an area which has uh, Wi-Fi or cellular. So once you click on the map, you, the map then opens. Um, this, the point, the blue point in the middle of the map is your location. Um, up here, you can turn layers on and off. You can, and there's other options that you can um, get to by clicking the ellipses. The most important point is this plus down in the lower right hand cor corner for an iOS. And you click that point and you, it brings up the layers that you can add data to. Now for just for ease of showing you in this demonstration. I don't have the lines or polygons in here. It's simply the point. So if you click on fault rupture, the fault rupture point adds, you can add a point by clicking add point, or you can click on the map where you want the point to be. You can take photos from right within the field maps application. If you're taking photos from within field maps, I highly recommend that you go change the setting um, for the resolution of the photos. You want it to be raw and not large or small or however um, the default setting is. And, in uh, field maps, but you can also then attach um, photos if you take photos outside of, of the field maps application and, and you can go into your gallery and attach them. I just wanted to throw this in here because if you do see red, it means that your GPS accuracy is not to the required standard, which is 30 feet in, um, in field maps. You can change that setting if you need to. The, one of the great things about field maps, which wasn't available in and collector, which was the previous data acquisition application for Esri is conditional visibility or smart forms. Smart forms allow us to make the app more user friendly on the, the user side. So you're only gonna see the fields that are associated with a particular deformation type that you're filling out. However, on the back end for the data 
compilation team, all of the data can be in one layer. So it helps, so it really makes it easier for both sides of the, um, of the data collection, the user side and the data side. So for example, here I chose fault rupture. Um, only the fields for fault rupture will show up. If I had chosen liquefaction, then liquefaction would show up. As you scroll down to some of the um, to some of the options that you can fill out, there is also conditional visibility built in to fault rupture. So, for example, if you choose fault slip um, and you choose vector measurements, another group of data fields shows up for vector measurements. If you were to choose slip component, which is the other option in fault slip, then those that group of fields would show up. And so, it really um, allows the user to only see those fields that they need to. And then you can also minimize this group by clicking the down arrow so you can shorten that list that you have to scroll through again. Once you collect your point, you simply click Submit. Um, if you're using the map live, it automatically goes to ArcGIS online. If you're using the map offline, you need to sync when you get back and all the data are, are um, synced to ArcGIS online and also synced down to your device. As far as data availability and sharing, CGS and USGS will be sharing a stripped down version of, of the data we acquire on the Learning from Earthquakes website, which you just heard Heidi talking about. Um, the stripped down version of the data will include location, date, and the organization of the person who collected that data. And we're doing this for a couple of different reasons. One is these data are raw. They have not been vetted by the geologists. Um, so they haven't gone in and, and edited maybe some shorthand that they're using. Um, the pictures haven't been QC'd and we really need to be cognizant of the, of the pictures and, and sensitive data that are getting out to the public. And so during an event, we will be sharing points and lines but with a limited amount of, of data associated with those data publicly. We do plan in the next event to use Esri dashboards as a communication tool for both to both the SOC and um, in the clearinghouse and to others who wish to look at our data. A dashboard is an interactive tool um, and it shows data as close to real time as possible. So the feature services that are populating this dashboard are the same ones which are being used in the fields. As you zoom in on the map, you the the data, the different, um, the data will show differently for, for what is visualized on the map. You can click on the points, you can see observational data, you can see photos, you can see the total of observations. Um, this proof of concept for a scientific dashboard was created by Luke Blair, and you can see it's based on Ridgecrest for the 7-1 and the 6-4 ruptures. Down here, there are um, the horizontal and vertical and slip measure slip sense for for each of the different ruptures. So it's a way for us to disseminate our data um, and people to see our data through a private group. You need to be added to the group in ArcGIS line, online to be able to see this, but the data are not downloadable. You can't go into this group and expect to download the data. It's simply a visualization tool. We're also hoping to have another dashboard that is more relevant to the information that they may use at the State Operations Center at Cal OES. So it'll show damage um, to facilities, utilities, um, and will will give, it's still an interactive map. We can still have some of the data show, but it's just for a different user. We also have to hope to have both of these displayed on a computer or on a projector in the clearinghouse at the physical location so it can help facilitate the response and, um, and maybe indicate areas where, where people haven't gone out to collect data yet. So we're really hoping that this facilitates our communication and our response efforts um, and also it gives people an idea of, of the data which are being collected that we can't download and share publicly at during an event. Um, data distribution are, um, I, I know it's a sensitive topic and there, are, there have been um, concerns about ownership of data, of sensitive data getting out. Um, everybody does have ownership over their data. They have the, they have the right to publish those data, to, to disseminate those data um, before, during and before an event or after an event. Um, one of the things if you, there's been discussion of whether 
of who should, who should curate and, and QA those data. In Napa and for Ridgecrest, it was um, CGS and USGS. We, we managed the, the data compilation database. Luke Blair is the lead of that. Um, and there's been talk of if this should, if the data compilation database should be more of a SCEC issue. So, so having multiple people QCing those data. Um, the, the idea of data ownership, if there is this, this collaborative database um, of data, then you know, it has to be made really clear about the ownership of those data, who, what happens to the data if they contribute data to this database. Um, and again, we have to be really sensitive of those, um, of, of imagery that could potentially get out. We don't want to be putting out data that shows people who happen to have passed away if it's a large urban earthquake. We have to be really cognizant of the information which we are making public. Um, and so also there's been discussion about how do we curate and distribute these large community source data sets, such as LIDAR, the optical imagery, um, who hosts those data, it takes a lot of server space to do that, who hosts it, who QCs it, who keeps it, you know, active. Um, and so there's so there's talks going on with that as well. And finally, for our future work and discussion, last week, just last week, we um, did finalize our schema for surface rupture, liquefaction, and slope movement, and no deformation for points, lines, and polygons. And that's currently in review. We are finalizing the schema for the damage layer. And I will probably be reaching out to some of you who may be on this talk to help us to build out that layer. We, although, you know, we want to make sure that if we are collecting any data about buildings or utilities, that we have enough really basic information to pass along to those people who need those data to get out to look at those facilities and utilities that our teams may come across and to ensure that that, that information is being shared appropriately. Um, we also need to work on a way, the best way for our field staff to vet their data, because now that everything is digital, it goes from their iPhone to ArcGIS online, the data compilation team downloads that data and it goes into the data compilation database. And so what we're missing now in this digital world is how do we get our, our field staff to vet their data? You know, before on paper and pencil, when they were adding it into the database, they would do a lot of this vetting, they would spell out, you know, abbreviations, they would ensure that that everything is correct, there, that everything made sense. Um, and we're missing that now. So we're trying to find the best way to vet those data, again, so that these data can be released quickly and accurately um, to everyone who needs them. We're hoping in the future that if, if you do want to add data to the CGS and USGS database, that it is in our schema when you submit it. If not, that's fine, we'll, we'll work with it, but it does allow us to not have to interpret your results to put them into the correct fields into our data schema. And so we are willing to share the data schema with you. I can send you the Excel file um, if you desire. And um, we have also discussed of having, um, having CGS and USGS manage another group that is open to people in um, d different organizations other than CS, uh, USGS and CGS to use our schema, to use our field maps. All you need is a free ArcGIS online developer account and you can be added to our organization. This other group would would, would work in parallel with the CGS and USGS group, but there'll be stricter standards um, and privileges so that you can only edit your own data, um, you can only download your own data, et cetera. Um, but those data will go then directly into the USGS CGS data compilation database. And so we are willing to host that group if people are interested in that as well. And then I just wanna mention before I, before I end here that, that Esri and or USGS and CGS are Esri shops. We do use ArcMap, we use ArcPro, we use ArcGIS online. And so therefore the field maps application does make the most sense for us to use. However, there are a lot of other um, open source and other programs out there for data acquisition. And um, that's really important to know. You don't just have to use Esri products. Any, you know, there's, there's a lot of other great data applications out there that can help you to acquire your data. With that, I would like to thank you. And if you want to put any questions into the Q&A, I will be happy to answer them um, during the question answer section. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Kate. That was really informative. Um, really appreciate that. 
uh, it's, it's amazing to look at how much we've progressed since the Northridge 1994 earthquake where we were using paper forms and then the advance in 2014 to Napa where we actually were, were starting to gain, the clearinghouse was starting to work within the GIS uh, atmosphere to the, to the programs that we have now. So it's just awesome. Our next speaker is gonna be Sherry Blankenheim with Cal OES. Sherry's gonna be talking about clearinghouse coordination with Cal OES, the state operations center, regions and local government. Good morning. I'm happy to be here to talk about um, the coordination with Cal OES and the State Operations Center, the regions, and local government. First, we'll talk a little bit about how the activation progress begins with the Earthquake and Tsunami Program duty officer. We have duty officer 24-7, so there's always someone watching to see exactly what's going on. We coordinate with the State Warning Center, which is the uh, Cal OES lead for notification and initial reporting on events. We also coordinate with the uh, California State Geologist and the Geological Survey to share um, interpretation and technical information and impacts that we might see uh, starting to occur. And the Seismic Hazards Branch will assign uh, staff to respond to the State Operations Center with the California Geological Survey. And then our information goes to the Cal OES Regional Operations Centers. And we would deploy staff there based on uh, event needs. The Y, Standardized Emergency Management System. This was uh, came into being, it uh, was introduced after the 1991 Oakland Hills fire. It was actually adopted into the government code in 1993. And the intent was to improve the coordination of federal, state, and local emergency management resources. It has become the cornerstone of our emergency response system and the fundamental structure for response phases of emergency management. It unifies all of the elements of emergency response into a single integrated system. And I put the government code section there for those of you who might wanna take a closer look. It includes the incident command system, which is the field level emergency response system, multi and interagency coordination. The clearinghouse is a great example of partnerships and multi-agency coordination. The mutual aid system for obtaining additional emergency resources from non-affected jurisdictions, state agencies or federal agencies. And then the operational area concept. And that's somewhat interchangeable. It includes the county and all the subdivisions to coordinate damage information resource requests and emergency response. Cal OES follows SEMS as required. And what this means is all emergencies and incidents are coordinated and managed at the lowest possible level, which means if it can be handled within a city, a city can request assistance from an operational area an operational area needs assistance perhaps from a region or from the state. And when the state becomes overwhelmed, then it reaches up to the federal level. Cal OES response and, and coordination in the field is aligned in alignment all the time with ICS, even though we're doing that through an emergency operations center in order to support that field response. Unified command is when all agencies with the legal or jurisdictional responsibility coordinate together to mitigate that event. And large events or disasters often required the uh, unified command. This is a SEMS organization chart. And the reason I show this to you, it looks very boxy and very technical. The earthquake clearinghouse is, and technical specialists fall into the planning section. Just wanna make a point, they're not in the operations section. They are not field forces deployed in response to the emergency itself. And the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services responsibilities are to protect the health and safety of people, preserve lives and property, and to achieve these goals, we set up these subdivisions of the state emergency services organization, and the structure facilitates the coordination between the counties. And this is kind of what a, a map of what it looks like. We have these regions, and we coordinate resources within those regions uh, before, and the intent is to get the closest resources to the point that needs them. Instead of taking resources from Southern California and sending them all the way up to Shasta or Modoc, we would work within that area and those closer regions in order to move those resources to them if they had a need. 
So the physical location of the earthquake clearinghouse, it is a large facility, number one, in a safe location with uh, inside space to work and to hold evening briefings and an area to park vehicles. During COVID, screening and social distancing would be in place and PPE would be available for those uh, inside the facility. Cal OES can mission tax state agencies to contribute resources during emergencies. So based on the event location and the availability of perhaps state facilities, I think in Napa, a Caltrans facility warehouse was used. And so we were able to help uh, with that coordination and we can mission task um, to be able to coordinate with Caltrans to be able to use that facility. Uh, we would also work with uh, local government, which is how the uh, Bridgecrest Clearinghouse got in place. It was through some coordination with Ridgecrest and one of our duty officers at the time, Yvette Leduc. Communications, after a large event, the earthquake and tsunami program is going to be with the California Geological Survey and we will both migrate to the State Operations Center to be available in place there. We may also be in the field supporting the clearinghouse and coordination of information between the SOC and the clearinghouse starts immediately after the event. The information will flow from the SOC to our regional contacts out to local government. And everyone can participate in the evening briefings. We've actually, I think it was in, after the Napa earthquake, we projected those briefings live in the State Operations Center so that everyone could hear uh, the data that was being shared. Emergency management priorities. It's really important to understand the scope of what's going on. We need to size up the incident. How widespread is the damage? What is the extent of the damage to buildings? Uh, are transportation arteries passable? Are there utility <coughs> disruptions or associated fires? So we're gonna look at situation status reports. In this day and age, media and social media will give us a lot to come through very quickly. We need to share aftershock forecasts and be aware of increased probabilities for larger events. We learned a lot about this, the importance of this in Ridgecrest with the follow-on event actually being the main event and the first event becoming the foreshock. Uh, reports from the field and field observations are very important. And then we have the ability to do hazardous runs and to work with FEMA on those hazardous runs to estimate levels of damage, impacts, and other things. And we can also do those hazardous runs for associated faults that might be um, questioned as to be involved or not involved, or perhaps the recipient of increased stress from the event itself. Scientific analysis from field observations and data. Uh, the implications may not be known um, right away, and so we'll be working with the clearinghouse to understand those. After slip, repaired infrastructure may need more repair. This ha actually happened in Napa one of the first events where there was surface rupture, to my understanding, and the after slip continued, continued to slip. And so local government and public works departments and utilities all needed to understand that that slip was continuing day to day and that areas that had been repaired needed to be revisited in order to ensure that they weren't breaking again or that they had enough leeway um, to absorb that slip as it continued to happen. Lateral spreading was something we saw a little more in the Ridgecrest earthquake where cracks might have been a, see, visible in facilities or buildings in the morning and then in the afternoon they were considerably larger. And as the aftershocks continued, it was a very uh, vigorous aftershock uh, pattern that the lateral spreading and the cracking, some of those things continued to move. And subsidence settling of various types of soil um, with increasing hazards due to larger continuous uh, aftershocks. Clearinghouse field participants are researchers, structural engineers, social scientists, um, and others, and they are not first responders. They're not part of the incident field response. They're not building inspectors. They are, will not assess the safety of structures and they will not tag buildings. If they encounter a hazard, they're always instructed to call 911 to report it to the appropriate authorities. Independently, they direct themselves to areas with physical features or damage that they need to see. Um, they also may investigate areas receiving high social media um, interest. 
And we had a couple of special requests during the Ridgecrest earthquake for um, to get a second look at some specific locations that were being reported to have a number of issues that may or may not be well understood or um, apparent at the initial inspection. And I caution you all that pictures on social media are not necessarily um, of the area they might say they're from. We have found instances where pictures from several years back have been posted as though they were a surface fault rupture of a recent event, and they in fact were not. So we need to be very careful as we're seeing those, uh, that information come up that we're able to validate or control or clarify where, where needed. Clearinghouse briefings are accessible by, by anyone um, who's on the earthquake clearinghouse email list. We also send that information out through the regions to uh, operational areas and, and local government. We um, distribute that call information and it can be further distributed by those operational areas. And when possible, the briefings are coordinated with SOC briefings so that we don't do the eight o'clock evening briefing in the state operations center at the same time we're trying to do the clearinghouse call, which has happened, but we're, we're working on that going forward. Um, gives us access to technical expertise from researchers, structural engineers, and geologic uh, subject matter experts. The direct coordination between Cal OAS and CGS ensures we have the most current data and information that we can pass on. It can help guide decisions, prioritization of resources, advance planning for, for subsequent operational periods as we see levels of damage come in and we start looking at those photos. It can help us uh, plan ahead for staffing or, or be aware of uh, resources that might be, need to be enhanced. It includes the ability to reach back to Cal OAS and or CGS for technical expl explanations or clarification, and the ability for local government or state agencies to connect with us to request information or review of a specific location and receiving validated information on an area or location that may be receiving the social media. Uh, Heidi alluded to the, the masonry issue in Napa. We do an after action in a hot wash when field investigations wind down and remaining information is gathered and the physical site is closed. Now the physical site doesn't stay open for a long period of time, typically, um, in the events that we have done to date. Briefing calls may continue if there's still data and the final call of the uh, event clearinghouse will occur and they uh, will begin the draft of an after action report. Now we also wanna remind you if you're gonna be out in the field, please, 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 Go to our earthquake early warning page, earthquake.ca.gov. Find the information that you need for downloading the MyShake app. If it's possible for the system to give you an alert when shaking is going to arrive um, and you might be in an area that might be treacherous, it's really important that you have access to this information. They've made some recent updates where you can change your home location. Uh, there's been a few changes to the tracking. Um, as always, be prepared. I'll throw in a non-structural mitigation plug here. If you're staying in a hotel near the area, please, if you're uh, headed to bed, take that lovely painting from over the head of the hotel bed and sit that aside, maybe put the lamp on the floor because if there are large aftershocks, uh, you need to make sure that you're gonna be safe wherever you are. And this is my contact information. If you have questions, please put them in a question and answer, we'd be happy to address those a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. That was really great. <clears throat> we appreciated that. Uh, Ridgecrest being the first earthquake that I was activated to respond on was a big learning curve, learning all that information that was so nicely summarized there. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, our next speaker, Don Glukert with Cal OES. Perfect. Looks good. Perfect. Good. All right. Good morning, everyone. I am Don Glukert from Cal OES. I am the lead on the Disaster Service Worker Volunteer Program at Cal OES. The first thing I need to do is to explain the difference between DSW and DSW Volunteer. Often a confusion. Every California employee, whether it's at a city, 
level, county level, or state level is a DSW, disaster service worker. It was something that was in your orientation package on your first day, and you swore the oath to uh, uphold the Constitution, et cetera, and you would, uh, if deployed by your supervisor, assist during a disaster or an emergency in California. I had the disaster service worker volunteer program. The big difference is volunteers are not paid by their employer to do volunteer work or disaster service work. DSWs are paid. If you're with a school and you're asked to go help uh, in some fashion because of an earthquake, then you are still getting paid by your employer. And if you're injured while performing those services, then you would file a workers' comp claim with your employer, not with the state. It's the opposite with the volunteer program. Volunteers do not get paid and they register with cities and counties or fire districts as maybe CERT volunteers or with sheriff departments as search and rescue volunteers. Those people are not being paid and if they are injured while performing services, then they can file to be eligible for a workers' comp claim to pay their medical bills. All right, let's go ahead and um, go through this program very quickly. So if you are a California employee in some fashion, whether it's with a city or a county, a school district, fire district, whatever, you already have these benefits through your employer. This is for the volunteers. Now, you, if you are a California employee, could become a volunteer in your free time. If you wanna spend your two week vacation volunteering with, with the disaster service worker volunteer program through your city or county, um, you certainly may do so. And then if you're injured at that time while performing disaster or emergency services, uh, you can apply for benefits through this program, the Cal OES DSW Volunteer Program. And so the whole program is about really two things. Workers' comp benefits, which will pay your medical care and uh, disability, supplemental job dis displacement, and um, lastly, uh, if you die, uh, we pay death benefits to your survivors. Um, and then there's also liability pr uh, protections um, that are just in law already, both state and federal, uh, which really means if you ruin somebody else's property in the performance of disaster services, uh, the legal process will handle this. So, um, Accredited Disaster Councils, ADCs, are all cities and all counties. This started after World War II. And by ordinance, they have to, they, or by ordinance, and it's accepted by Cal OES, uh, they're able to register volunteers to have a volunteer force and uh, to be able to train them and deploy them and supervise. They also um, must have a, a mutual aid agreement with surrounding communities um, in their own region. Um, their responsibility is to supervise and train, as I said, and then to activate or deploy these people. They also keep records and they have to, to submit uh, to my desk uh, claims, workers' comp claims. It's not up to the injured person, it's up to the supervising entity to submit that. Who can be a DSW volunteer? Virtually everyone in California who is both mentally and, and physically capable of doing something in a disaster. And it could be just sitting at a computer helping out, or it could actually be someone such as the search and rescue, hiking in the rugged mountains, looking for a lost person. Um, 
cities and counties are also able to designate who can be an authorized designee. And it's always the sheriff's department or a um, fire department who can be authorized. Anyone can be a volunteer. They don't have to be employed. Um, and California allows undocumented or non-citizens to also be volunteers. Uh, the only caveat is that because they must swear an oath to the Constitution of the United States and California's Constitution, they must be aware that it doesn't conflict with their own uh, loyalty to perhaps their native country. Um, if they say, I, yes, I, I want to do this, but I can't swear the oath to the United States, then we cannot accept them as a volunteer. This is in law. Um, and then minors can also be volunteers, but their uh, parents or guardians must sign that it's okay. So the volunteer is someone who's registered with an accredited disaster council or an authorized designee. Um, Cal OES primarily does not register um, volunteers except in two categories. That would be SAP, uh, which is part mentioned here in this program, the earthquake uh, clearinghouse, and also, um, shoot, I forgot the name. They're the pilots who, uh, Civil Air Patrol, there it is. Thank you, Don. Um, of course, they don't get paid and they're activated by their registering agency. Um, people cannot self-activate. If they say, oh, there's something out there, I'm gonna go help, you know, their heart's in the right place. However, um, self-activation is a non-starter for workers' comp benefits if they're injured. Okay, so disaster service eligible activities are listed here on this screen. Um, proclaimed emergencies, which would become, which are proclaimed either by a mayor, uh, the elected officials of a county, um, or the governor, such as the COVID. We are still in a COVID proclaimed emergency statewide. Um, search and rescue missions, usually almost 99.9% .9 handled by sheriff departments in every county. Activities to mitigate imminent threat of extreme peril, which means that um, there is a flood coming or the, the Oroville Dam's going to break and they had to evacuate everyone. They needed people to fill sandbags and so on. Those are emergency activities. Um, official mutual aid, which would mean helping out another county as requested. Uh, out of state, is not allowed unless the uh, director of Cal OES, Mark Ghirlanducci, actually authorizes that in writing. And that, that would come down through supervisory channels. And then um, if dispersed or activated, deployed volunteers are sent to an emergency um, or disaster scene to perform their services, and they're involved in a traffic collision or some sort of road incident, they would be allowed to file for workers' comp claims for their injuries on that, only for their person. Their car, is, their car or vehicle is not uh, insured by Cal OES. Uh, what we don't include are day-to-day, -day, house fire, traffic collisions, et cetera pre-planned activities such as staffing a booth at a health fair. That's not an emergency. Um, and the list is there, uh, and I already mentioned self-activation. We also do not allow an eligibility for injury when people are traveling to or from a training activity. Now, basically Cal OES, and this program, the DSW Volunteer Program, allows the eligibility for volunteers who are injured during an emergency or disaster or training, an official training for an emergency or disaster to file for workers' comp claims 
at that time, but we don't allow travel to the training site as one of those activities. So registration is very simple. It's an easy form. Um, the person must include all of the information about themselves. Who are you? Where do you live? Phone number, cell number, et cetera. And at the bottom of the registration form is a loyalty oath where the person uh, can, uh, well, they must subscribe to the oath of the US and the California constitution. Um, they must print their name and sign it. Um, if they don't sign it, if a person says, well, I can't sign it because it's against my, my faith or whatever, they cannot become a volunteer and that's in California law. Um, and then an official from the registering jurisdiction must also sign that form to make it valid. And um, all, of course, all these forms have to be completed before the person is deployed. Um, cannot get car insurance to cover an accident that you had yesterday. You have to have everything ahead of time. And the same with this form. These are the classifications of volunteers. There's 13 classifications. And you can see number 11 down there, right towards the bottom is safety assessment program, the SAP program. Uh, these are the engineers and evaluators who um, go into earthquake areas or buildings to determine whether other rescuers or volunteers can be allowed in. And that is one of the programs that uh, people sign up or register with Cal OES. Um, every other kind of volunteer fits into one of the categories on here. And a person can be listed under multiple categories, not just one. Volunteers have to be supervised and the ADC, Accredited Disaster Council, or the authorized designee, sheriffs or fire department, they determine who the supervisor is. It could be one of their own, or it could be a volunteer who has extreme knowledge of how to perform disaster activities. It is those supervisors who are responsible for filing the workers' comp claims with Cal OES um, if a person is injured. So here is training. It could be classroom training or outdoor exercises. It has to be specific to that person's or to those, to those persons' um, classification for which they have registered. And um, it also has to be approved in advance by whoever that supervisor is. People get activated. And I've had this question very, very frequently. What if there's a major earthquake in our area and all the cell phone towers are down and there's no electricity and there's no TV, you know, et cetera? How do we know? Well, during training, people's supervisors of their own program ought to be having a, a standard operation procedure that's in writing that would say something such as, if we have a communication blackout, then group A, you guys meet at the Safeway, and group B, you guys meet over by the fire station, and your supervisors will be there. So that's, they don't always have to be verbally called out. It could be that, okay, this has happened, we know what to do. And that's not self-activation, that's done in advance. They predetermine what these people must do. So we need to have those forms, uh, the supervisory or, or the registration forms kept on file at the ADC or the um, authorized designee where these people registered. Because if they are injured, then I need to have a copy of, of that form. If they're injured, there's certain forms they have to send me. They can be found on the Cal OES website, the claim, two claim forms, 
that are, are from SCIF, State Comp Insurance Fund, who's our insurance car carrier. Uh, the forms are, the claim forms are in English. Well, actually the volunteer form is in English and Spanish and they are gender neutral. Uh, the claim forms um, are in English and Spanish as, where, as well. So you can see it says required documents. That's what I have to have if, if uh, someone is, is injured. And this has to happen fast. You know, not a few weeks afterwards. It's it's within uh, five working days by law. We need to have these things. Um, and if they were injured because of a training, I need to have a copy of the pre-authorized uh, training and a, a copy of the sign-in sheet. Um, this is one of the forms, the 3301 claim form. That one you give to the volunteer. The volunteer can fill out the top portion. If they're capable, if they're not, then the supervisor at that incident can fill out the entire form and get that to me. The next form is this one, the 3267. Um, this is completed by the supervisor only, and a copy is not given to the injured person. The previous form, the 3301, give a copy to the injured person because if they go to an ER, they need to say, this is a worker's comp claim and they hand them this form. So they know to bill uh, Cal OES and not the individual person. Um, so for a training, this is what we have to have. And if you are ever one of the supervisors, you know, this is easy to find. Um, these, and you can always call me as well. Um, a written incident report is on what happened. And this has to be written by the supervisor. Who, what, where, when, and why. Very easy, you know. Don't, don't have the, the injured person fill it out. This has to be from a supervisor's perspective. Um, I go back. Okay, this is a screenshot of the DSW volunteer webpage on the Cal OES website. And you can see that um, number two, DSW program guidance, that's a booklet, it's about 89 pages. And it's the Bible of this program, of the volunteer program. Um, a lot of what the volunteer program does is a crossover to DSW programs in individual cities and counties statewide. Um, so if you happen to be a DSW volunteer supervisor at some point, this is where you would come and download uh, these, um, these documents. And finally, thanks for letting me present this to you. Um, that's my contact information. I'm Don Glukert and my supervisor is Hilda Vargas. She's awesome. And if you call her instead of me, she'll just call me. <laughs> so her uh, daily or weekly plea to me is don't get hit by a bus down. I've got too much to do already. So um, the best thing to do to get to that page, if you want to download it, is in red there. Go to caloes.ca.gov, click on the magnifying glass, which is the search icon and put in DSW volunteer. It'll take you right to the web page where you can um, view, read about it, view the appropriate documents and even download them. So that's it. Thank you so much everyone for allowing me to speak. And if you have questions, put them in the, the uh, chat box then. Thank you, Don, that was great. I just want to make a, a, a correction. I uh, um, mentioned that to put two questions in the chat. It's best if we put them in the question and answer. We will be monitoring the chat though, but we'll try to concentrate them all in the question and answer section. Um, our, ne Thank our next speaker is Gerber Singh and he's gonna be talking about the safety assessment program. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's still morning, I think. Um, I'll be talking about the Cal OES SAP. Uh, it's also known as the Safety Assessment Program. Uh, background on me, I'm a civil engineer here at Cal OES. And um, there's three state volunteers, I mean, sorry, excuse me, 
uh, there's three state coordinators in the OES program, and I'm one of them. Um, just a little background on um, SAP. It's um, intended to help local governments perform safety evaluations as quickly as possible after disasters. Um, we basically want to reduce impacts on shelters. We want to get people back to their homes and businesses as quickly as possible. Um, a little background on SAP history. Um, it basically began after 1971 Selmar earthquake. Um, we began issuing cards uh, and formal training after uh, 1987 Whitt Whittier Narrows earthquake. Um, that also led to ATC 20 uh, in 1989 and ATC 45 in 2004. And after 2005, we started to include windstorms, floods, fires, explosives, in our training and after 2020, uh, snow loads and debris flows. Um, this is our manual. Um, as you can see, there's also the ATC 20 and ATC, ATC 45. Um, this manual is updated um, every few years and you could find all of these online for a PDF free copy. Um, so SAP is uh, managed by Cal OES. Um, it covers multiple hazards like um, earthquakes, um, uh, windstorms, um, fires, all sorts of things. And um, we also work with multiple disciplines. Um, so there's three different trainings available from us. Uh, first is the evaluator training. Um, these are the people that go on the uh, go out and uh, look at buildings, uh, do inspections. Uh, coordinators tend to stay back and they coordinate the evaluators. And the trainers, of course, can train evaluators and coordinators. Um, concept of operation. Um, SAP is a state uh, resource used to help local governments and do the, does not replace local government oversight of the disaster. SAP fits in with Incident Command System, ICS, and so is compliant with the Standard Emergency Management System, SIMS, um, and Federal National Incident Manager, NIMS. SAP help is requested through the Online Response uh, Information Management System, RIMS. All right, so SAP Memorandum of Understanding. Um, it's necessary to identify um, SAP costs for FEMA eligibilities and to identify responsibilities for Cal OES and local governments regarding their system. Um, requesting SAP aid, uh, local governments can estimate um, how many uh, SAP personnel they need, depending on uh, the destroyed and damaged buildings or uh, infrastructure. And um, there's a formula that we have that you could download uh, on our manual and you can see how many coordinators or um, evaluators you need. Um, type of resources. Um, there's three different um, types of people that can respond in California. There's the DSW volunteer, as Don uh, talked about. Uh, these are private or um, retired personnel. There's the local and also the state. Um, we accept multiple different types of licenses to be a SAP member. Um, some of them are civil engineers, structure engineers, architects, geologists, um, also engineering geologists. And we also accept um, ICC. And here's a list of all the ICC professions we cover. Um, once you complete our training, you receive this card in the mail. Um, there's three different cards, like I mentioned, the state, volunteer, and local. Um, however, uh, we offer SAP training outside of California too. So um, if you're outside of California state, you'll get um, a state-based card like this one in Oregon. Um, immunity from liability under the SAP is provided by California Good Samaritan law and uh, persons being deputized by local government. Uh, volunteers are also covered in immunity from liability. Uh, by being deployed by Cal OES as described in the uh, California Emergency Services Act and also under the California Business and Professional Code. Local government SAP evaluators under the mutual aid are also covered under the immunity provided by their home jurisdictions. 
per the California Master Mutual Aid Agreement. Um, uh, workers' comp, um, as Don uh, talked about, um, local resources, DSW local um, are given co compensation by their local home jurisdiction. Um, DSW state are provided compensation by the state and volunteers if deployed by the state or the local government. Uh, evaluator role. Um, so these are the people that go out and look at buildings. Uh, they do uh, rapid assessments on buildings to make sure uh, they're safe to enter. And um, if they're questionable buildings or uh, if they need a secondary um, evaluation, they also do detailed evaluations. What SAP evaluators do not do is they do not provide cost estimates on the damaged buildings, um, nor do we escort people on and off their property. We on, we're only there to simply look at the structure and see if it's safe. Um, here's one of the placards that we place if the building is safe and safe to enter for people. Um, the yellow one uh, is a restricted access, so um, sometimes parts of the buildings can be damaged and some are safe to enter. Um, so we'll put a yellow placard on the areas that is unsafe. Red basically indicates the building is completely unsafe and should be, um, should be away from it. Um, California. Um, safety assessment program resources are available to other states through EMAC. And Cal OES is actively interested in conducting train the trainer classes for other states. We've sent out people to Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and also the Alaska earthquake in 2018. Um, some of the infrastructure uh, areas we cover are roads, bridges, pipelines, pump stations, airports, uh, a variety of things. Um, here's an example of uh, some of the areas that we visited. Um, as you can see, um, the bottom left is the water treatment plant that was damaged. Um, top left is a uh, elephant foot uh, steel reservoir that uplifted during an earthquake, and also the bridge damage in the in the center right there. Um, so the hazards I was talking about, we cover earthquakes, windstorms, floods, fires, debris flows, explosives, um, snow loads, failure, structure failures, all sorts of things. Um, here's a building that was damaged during an earthquake. Um, this received a red placard when it was a, a, uh, initially inspected. Um, but just to show you, uh, this building was repaired and uh, restored completely. So just because we put a red placard on does not mean the building is completely unusable and should be demolished. Uh, here's a good example of a house that was damaged. Um, so uh, SAP uh, evaluators aren't only looking at buildings that are damaged, they're also looking at the surroundings. You can see the building in the back. Um, it's also unsafe because at any moment the house can fall on top of that other house. So. Uh, we make sure to look at the surroundings as well. Here's a building that was damaged by um, winds in a hurricane. Uh, as another example of a house, uh, the roof was torn off during hurricane and um, it caught on fire, um, but the door is still good. Um, here's another example of a tornado um, that destroyed homes. Um, Sapi elevators were mobilized and uh, they assessed the building damaged. Um, here's an example of a fire uh, that went through um, Santa Rosa, California in 2017, the Tubbs fire. And here's um, structure damage caused by debris flow. Another example of an explosive uh, fertilizer plant in West Texas. And um, snow load in Massachusetts and the structure was severely damaged. Um, we also train our uh, SAP folks about safety. Um, we teach them to uh, uh, practice uh, proper safety gear, PPE, and um, create their go kits uh, if they're um, deployed. Um, we also teach them about USAR markings, search and, uh, urban search and rescue markings. Here's another example of um, 
safety, you, you want to be careful where you walk. You don't want to walk under those cars or um, any of that. Here's another good example of safety. Um, you don't want to be like the individual right there sitting under that um, middle. <laughs> and good thing he's wearing a hard hat. And finally, uh, briefly wrapping this up, um, you could find all this information on our website. Um, you could just go to Cal OES and search SAP. Um, you could also participate in some of our trainings, they're free. And you can also download manuals um, and um, look at what the placards are. And if you have any questions, you could email us. Um, all three of the state um, coordinators will get an email if you use that email. So um, any one of us can answer at any time. Thank you. If you're if you want to stand online and uh, listen to any questions, we'll be uh, following up on any questions that have been entered in the question and answer um, um, option that's at the bottom of the uh, webinar. Um, I accidentally also entered uh, that you put questions in chat. We are surveying that, but we prefer that you put them in through the Q and S uh, Q and A uh, section at the bottom of the, um, the screen. So I um, thank all of our speakers today. These have all been great. Um, while we're looking through our questions, I just want to remind you all that um, these recordings will be on the Clearinghouse website. Uh, also, the slides uh, individually will be on there as well, and that's at earthquakeeqclearinghouse.org. Hi, uh, Cynthia. There was a question from Marcel Herrera, and she asked, where do we get current forms and do they need to be renewed? Which forms are you speaking of, Marcella? Well, if she's talking about my forms, they're all on the website. Yeah, if you go to caloes.ca.gov, Sherry, if you click on the magnifying glass, which is a search token, and then type in DSW volunteer. It will take you to um, another page and then select DSW V program web page. And everything is there on that page. All of the documents that you would need, the claim forms, the registration forms, and the guidance booklet. And my email as well. So if people want to uh, connect with me directly, my email is there and my phone number. Um, the DSW volunteer program is not complicated, but there are rules and the rules aren't mine. The rules are from uh, the state legislature. So um, I'm happy to explain clarifications. Now the question came up, um, but do we need to renew them each year? Do this? No. The, 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 if a person is still volunteering, um, keep them going. Uh, there is a space for expiration, and that's up to the discretion of the jurisdiction who is enrolling these people. If they want them to re-enroll every, say, three years because they want the forms to be updated, people move, new phone numbers, et cetera, that's a good business practice, but we don't require that they do that. I found so that- they don't the, have to renew. <clears throat> the magnifying glass on the Cal OES webpage is also the best way for me to find the safety assessment program. It's a little bit of an Easter egg <laughs> on our website, so it's, it's much easier, faster to search. Mm -hmm. Any other questions people would like to enter into the Q&A? I guess we explained everything very clearly. Any messages?
Oh, a poll. Oh, a okay. poll. There is a poll to see if you're all still listening. <laughs> we got 74 people still on. Please answer the poll. <laughs> And Cindy, let me just add, I just really encourage everyone to subscribe to the mailing list. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and put that for the Cal for the California Clearinghouse. And I will um, put that into the chat right now. Um, it's a pretty simple form. Um, you just kind of fill out some of your contact information. Even if you've done it before, um, kind of it'll it'll log you in again. So if you're uncertain, if you've registered before filling it out again, you won't get double messages. You'll just kind of make sure that you've got the correct email account on in our records. Yeah, so if that, um, we also do appreciate anyone filling out the poll um, to understand your feedback about this webinar. We will be hosting this webinar again. So any feedback we could potentially incorporate to the next one. So we appreciate your input. It's a great thing to get on the email list because as we've noticed, we have earthquakes on holidays and it's not so easy to be able to reach out to someone immediately. So if you're already on the email list and something occurs after hours or on a holiday and we start to ramp up, then you're going to get that information directly and you'll be able to um, get synced in and sit in on the first calls. The calls are super intriguing. The information shared is Nothing short of amazing. Being able to see things that you can't get out there to see yourself. And so it's a very, very, very helpful. And we thank you all for joining us today to learn more about the Earthquake Clearinghouse. And that, that email list would be great too as we move ahead. Um, Ann Rosinski was awesome about having um, um, a monthly or bi-monthly meetings and we can utilize that list to kick off a, a new series of meetings again. We've kind of been overwhelmed since Ridgecrest. We're just finally starting to climb out from some of that um, or most of it I should say, but um, yeah, we'd like to look forward to starting that again and that's could be one of the best ways we can get in touch with get you invited on that list. I did see a question pop up in the chat. Sorry about the GIS training in May. Um, just to let you know, the GIS training that I'm currently doing is um, for emergency managers and it's an introduction into GIS and the field maps training. Um, I am teaching it in Sacramento on April 26th and 27th. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> and I don't have the dates right in front of me. And then in Long Beach on May 11th and 12th. Um, I still do have some room um, in the Sacramento training and a couple of seats in Long Beach. Um, if you want to contact me, I will put my email into the chat. Um, but it is, um, it is a priority for emergency managers at this point to get seats in the class. But if there is any open um, seats left, and I will accept um, others. Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, I thank you all for, for coming. This has been a great turnout. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to hear about the Clearinghouse. If you want to listen to us again, we'll be doing this in May. Um, and uh, the recordings will be put on the website as well as the slides. So thank you very much. <laughs>